when these students gather together to study in the midst of a spirit of restlessness, thank God for the power of God that stabilizes their character and their conduct and helps them stand true to the Almighty. I read an article, and I'm sure you did, stating recently that Isaiah was written by two Isaiahs. And I can understand why that they would reckon that way, because Isaiah talks about Calvary. He talks about the death of Jesus Christ, the sufferings and agonies of the man of Galilee. And then he leaves this old world and goes over into a millennium reign. That's altogether different. And they couldn't understand how a man like that. Now, over the years, there's been a controversy over it. There have been the liberals who said two men wrote it. They never saw each other. And uh, they wrote uh, at different periods of time. So their Bible, their, their, their writings are not uh, connected at all. But someone in compiling the scripture recklessly got them together because they were Isaiah's. And uh, there you have the book. And then this article came out to settle the controversy. They put all of this in a computer machine and it came out. Two Isaiah's wrote it, so that settled it. Now, I don't know how far we're going in the computer age, but I'm afraid we've already gone too far in some areas when we're expecting a machine that we have individual speed material in to come out with our answer while we lounge around and let our minds just lazily exist. We're in trouble, my friend. Yeah. And that I don't know might be the basis of one of the troubles that our government is dealing with in calming the restless situation of the hour. Yeah. God has given you and me a mind. Oh, I know some minds are more brilliant than others, but we have minds, sound minds. And oh, what that mind can do it's important to your salvation. It's important to your getting to heaven. Jesus included in the commandment of all commandments when he simply said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart and soul and mind. But a mind purified by the blood of Jesus Christ and by the refining fire of the Holy Ghost and the word of the living God, under such anointing there's no limit so it's creative power in thinking things and doing things and projecting things and in depicting to us the hidden truths of this good old book in these last days. God wanted man to think. That's why he said, come now and let us reason together. We're trying to get God completely out of our area of reason. And then man can think any way he wants to without reason. God deals in the basis of man's faculty of reason, and I'm so glad for that. <coughs> now, I'm not against computers. When it comes down to historical events, I'd rather they look up a lot of these dates than for me to have to commit them to memory and try to pass a test. And when it comes to mathematical problems, I, I, I can see where they can be accurately. But when it comes to their doing my own personal yeah. thinking, they're not able to tell you whether I want hot biscuits and ham in the morning for breakfast or not. I don't know of any more than I wouldn't want it, but to, at the same time, they don't know it. These computer machines, I want to do some of my thinking myself, yeah. whether it comes to the natural or especially the spiritual. And God wants to deal with our minds He's omniscient. He knows it all. And I'm so glad that he can commute with us. And one of the areas of such a, uh, communication is with our minds and our souls, our inner being, our heart. And God wants us to absolutely say, you lay aside machine. I'll let you take care of my historical data and also my mathematical problems. But when it comes to communicating to my creator, I'm going to do that myself. I don't even want my pastor to do all of that, as important as he might be. But we are here for a purpose, my friend. And that's none other than to do the will of God in these last days, to be a channel that God might reach 
the hearts of a lost world that's out there across the gulf. And we're to span that gulf as a means of getting God's mercies and grace across the great divide. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul was one that gave his heart and life to the Master. He knew some things. I found some that felt Paul was out of the will of God and going to Jerusalem. I never have believed it myself, farther from it now I ever have been. But uh, I do know he was warned. And when the last attempted scene came, he just simply said, What means you to weep and break mine heart? For I'm not only willing to be bound in Jerusalem, I'm willing to die there for the Lord Jesus Christ, for his cause, for his name, down deep inside in the midst of a warning everywhere he went that trouble, pain, and unfortunate things are coming your way, Saul of Tarsus. But down beneath all of that, that was that urge to go on there. You've got a testimony in the city. You've got some men that will have to listen to you talk. And he went right on down into Jerusalem, on to Rome, to testify to the Caesars over there and to tell the greatness of the Almighty God in the last day. We're living in times when we're seeing signs that we've never seen before. I, I don't think this age has had an exact parallel in any history gone by. Some of it, of course, has. But again, we come down to what we talked about this morning in the Sunday school class, where John, where Matthew said that the scripture might be fulfilled. There are some things, my friend, that we're seeing open before our eyes today. I never thought a few years ago that I'd ever see Israel gathered back in the land of Palestine. And then after I saw that, I didn't think I'd ever see them on the very site on which apparently the ancient temple was erected in that long ago. I didn't. But all of these signs now, and you remember reading what Billy Graham said just recently in the paper, or it was in the paper recorded, that the thing in Cambodia and Vietnam is only a sideshow to what's really taking place between the Arab and the Jewish world. And my friends, these are signs. What are they having to do with? Not exactly the rapture of the church, but God's turning loose of the Gentiles and going to the Jews again. And that all should transpire after the rapture of the church. The signs we're seeing now have to do with God's dealing with the Jews on the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. And that simply means God's run out of signs as far as the rapture is concerned. It seems it's almost past due, but God doesn't work that way. To us it might seem past due, but when that thing comes due, 12 o'clock noon, the thing will transpire. I'm not so sure, but what God's just waiting for a few more to come out of the Gentile world and become a member of the great bride of Christ. And then that trumpet's going to sound. I don't know, it might be right here at Jones Mill that the last one will be saved to constitute the bride of Christ. And immediately the trumpet sound and we go home to be with Jesus. It may be in Africa, India, or Peru, or some other place. I don't know, but I believe it's coming to pass. God is letting us see some things and at the same time down deep inside. And talking with our missionaries the other day and some correspondence that we have with others of our missionaries. Not only in the real of the United States of America and real Pentecostal outpourings in our churches, but in revivals overseas, in faraway places, every time there's an outpouring of the Spirit. God's Spirit says Jesus is coming very soon, and you better be ready when he comes. Now that is universal, where there's a heart in tune. The same song and testimony rings out, he's coming soon. Blessed be his wonderful name. And to know that you and I have the honor of living in this very age when he's coming back again. I know it would have been wonderful if I could have had the grace and the faith to have stood by him on Golgotha's hill and had him talk with me along with John. But how wonderful it is to have him walk right by our sides, in our hearts, right down here. And then know that he's waiting to meet us in the clouds of glory, that we might be faithful to the very end. God is so good. When those Jews that we read about in our Sunday school lesson this morning <coughs> stand at the white throne judgment 
And I have a feeling, I don't know, maybe it's mysticism, I don't want to get mystical, however, but even if God doesn't have the very inscription there preserved, it'll be very vivid in all of their minds. This one that's coming, or we're coming before now, by whom we shall be judged. We said, let his blood be on us and on our children. And Pilate said, this is your king right here on the cross and refuse to change it. And while Pilate said it and the very inscription itself said it, we said, no, it isn't. And there they stand without an excuse. All they of the Grecian world, the Roman world, and uh, uh, the religious world will have to recognize Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. But I'm glad when he comes back again to reign a thousand years, there's going to be a few Jews left that are going to cry out, Where, blessed and holy is he! that cometh in the name of the Lord. And they turn away from their Judaism to accept him who hath been endearing our lives now for some few decades. Thank God we're here by heaven's appointment and we're under his assignment. We must be faithful. God's dependent upon us. What if Abraham had failed? What if uh, Paul had failed? What if those great patriarchs had failed? What if Jesus had failed? No, they went right on. Christ said, yes, it is suffering. In essence, he said it. His very nature cried out, let this cup pass from me. But he was aware of the fact, I've got a work to do. For this hour came I into the world. Don't try to leave before you finish your job, my friend. Stay faithful to God. Finish it up. And then let the Lord go and lead your life from day to day. How do you find the will of God? I think the 12th chapter of Romans tells you how. After you've been justified by the blood of Jesus Christ, after you've been sanctified by the Holy Spirit, by the blood of Christ, by the word of the living God, then give yourselves daily a living sacrifice to be used, all of you, for God's cause. And then Paul says, you can know what is that good, what is that acceptable, and what is that perfect will of God. Not three wills of God. He's describing one will of God here. It's a good will, it's an acceptable, and it's a perfect will of God. Don't try to bargain with God about a dozen wills. He doesn't have it for you. You're either in his will or you're out of his will. He can't have you fulfill a dozen places and not know which one you're going to choose or allow you. You don't have multiple choice. You're just in God's will or you're out of his will. But I'm glad he can lead us by his will, his power, and his authority. And we can let it go down in the aisles of glory as Jesus said because he said that he'd help us do it. I have finished the work that you've given me to do. I've manifested your name. I've declared your glory and I've given them thy word. Praise the Lord for that.